The transcendental mind, the, the part that stores its love and wisdom, um, I, I can't say I have a suspicion of what it, where its domain is, but I have a feeling that it's a domain that's at a higher consentic sphere than what our senses identify. I've been blessed to, since 1984, explore uh, clinically with my method uh, dealing with grief and dying. And then back in 19, gosh, this would have been 1975, six, 1976, I was down uh, studying, I was down surfing down in El Salvador, and I came across this procession of a group of people that were celebrating a death of a mayor. And um, I was going, these people are celebrating and dancing and having a party. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. These people perceive him being freed from his body and he's set free as a soul. And they were celebrating death. And then I saw people from uh, Greek backgrounds who were wearing black for two years and when somebody died and they're mourning death. And I thought, isn't that interesting? The same exact process, complete opposite belief systems and the way they respond. And that put me on a journey is what what is this this fear of death and fear of life and um, what, what do, the, all the different theories about it. So I'm going to just summarize it this way that uh, my observation doing the Demartini method on in the breakthrough experience and working clinically on 3,588 deaths now. Uh, I've yet to see a death without a transformation. I see that all the human behavioral traits that an individual displays or demonstrates when they die immediately surfaces in one or many people, male or female, close or distant, uh, self or other, and I don't see a loss. I see a transformation. It's almost like energy is conserved and it's moved into a new form, and the information is now manifested in new forms. I really got to see that also when I was 14 in my life when I started living on the streets and hitchhiking. I started noticing that other people started playing the role of my family even though I wasn't clinically with my family, right there with my family, I've seen other people playing the roles of it. And that made me pause and think, wow, I've got a new family showing up. It's changing form. And the world uh, is just transforming. So what happens is when in the Demartini method on side C, the grief process, which we're working on a book on right now, uh, the moment a person feels the grief and loss of something, I go, so what specific trait, action, inaction do you perceive you lost as a result of that death? when they died, and they'll say, oh, I miss their conversations, I miss their hugs, I miss their smiles, I miss their sense of humor, I miss this, this, this. And you'll find out it's always things that supported their values and didn't challenge them that they miss. And that's what they're grieving the loss of. And then I go, now, who is it that emerged the moment this person died, that emerged that took on that role around you, including yourself? Who took on that role? And it's not hard. It's very simple. I do it very quickly every weekend. And I show them until it's quantitatively and qualitatively balanced, they see that there's a new form that's come on. And it's it's like a shocking when they first go like, oh, I can't believe that I, I started taking that role. My brother took on that role. My father took on that role. Uh, my best friend took on that role. So what happened is what was what supposedly was dead is now manifested in new form. The, the behavior is showing up in new form. Then I find the drawback of the original behavior to crack the infatuation they had and then find the benefit of the new one, and then the grief is dissolved. It's very simple. The grief is dissolved in a matter of two hours or less. Done. Over with. And they realize that there was nothing but a transformation, and there was no loss. So then I realize, hmm, we, we can show evidence that all the behaviors that an individual displayed or demonstrated is immediately emerged in other people. And if I can demonstrate that, then we have to acknowledge that when somebody dies, at least some of their behavior is now manifesting in other people. And that's shocking to some people who have never seen it, but I do it every week, and I've got proof. They've done study now in, in Japan on it, and we've got a book coming on it. But then we look carefully. We look at the physical body. The physical body upon death, I think that unless you've gone through some sort of cremation, which then combusts it, uh, you may put it in a sarcophagus, or you may put it in water, you may put it with the birds, or whatever forms of funeral you have. Um, eventually that is recycled into the elements and put into other plants and animals and insects or, or germs or bacteria or something like that. So your physical atoms are recycled. Your behavioral traits are recycled through other people. And by the way, if you have the opportunity to see who took it on, you'll find out that that's migrating and changing as 
the days and weeks go on. And I had this firsthand experience when my wife passed away. I got to see all the different behaviors she had, 139 of them, who took, took on all the roles. So I see no evidence of anything lost. I see the elements recycled. I see the organic material decomposed and recycled and used as food of life building for others. So life is now transformed from one individual now into many individuals of insects, animals, or whatever that eats it, consumes it. I see the gases released in the atmosphere and used and recycled. So the elements are recycled. The food is recycled to other animals. They have now life at the point of death. And I see the behavior of all the information transforming into other people. Uh, now, there's some peculiar things that happens in the breakthrough experience when somebody does the Demartini method on somebody that died and has passed away. Uh, they have now interesting conversations with people at the end uh, with surrogates that communicate and say things spookily that reminded them and resembled and almost verbatim of what the individual that was alive said. So now I think that there's one other component. So the, the atoms and molecules are recycled. The behavior collectively is recycled as energy and information. But it seems that the information that was loved and appreciated, which I call the superconscious mind, is also recycled. Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, what language you might want to use. There's various languages for it. Some people call it the newest sphere. Some people call it a heaven, uh, which just means sky or skyward. Um, but it appears that the information that is loved and appreciated, that is communicated as love and appreciation, is also accessible even after death. And I've done that thousands and thousands of times. And uh, somebody who's never seen that, it's, it's worth seeing the breakthrough experience and catching that, wa watching it live. It's quite profound. I had an 11-year-old girl one time be the surrogate for a 57-year-old woman who had done her mother who had passed away, who was 76. And when we uh, got the surrogate, the 11-year-old girl got picked as the surrogate for the 76-year-old woman. And when she played the role of it, she started having a palsy in the left hand and started saying things that only the mother of this 57-year-old woman knew. And it spooked the room out because she had access to information that we don't know where she got it. Uh, but it was the information, it was the nicknames, it was the, the movements, it was behaviors, it was the memories of what that lady had. And it was all tears of gratitude and love demonstrated. It wasn't emotional, but it was uh, very tearing and very heart opening. So I have a feeling that everything that we've, everything that we've equilibrated in our mind and brought into objectivity that is actually put into perfect equilibrium and I call loved, uh, seems to be stored in a superconscious mind, the best way I can call it, a panpsychic superconscious mind that could be in a domain that transcends our, our senses here. Um, we could call that heaven if you want. We could call that accessible through uh, incarnation if you want. That's fine. And But then the human behavior, the behavioral traits that we tend to judge in people and in like and dislike seem to be conserved right here on the planet and the physical molecules seem to be recycled into the elements. So I have a feeling that all those things can be accounted for and demonstrated. The only thing is the transcendental mind, the, the part that stores its love and wisdom, um, I, I can't say I have a suspicion of what it, where its domain is, but I have a feeling that it's a domain that's at a higher concentric sphere than what our senses identify. But it, it's definitely there. I've seen it too many times. I've taken too many hundreds of people through the process, the Demartini method, and had them communicate with people that have passed away and spookily. I had six chiropractors uh, up in, I think it's Kitchener, Ontario, where we, we did B.J. Palmer, who is the son of the founder of chiropractic, and we read, read a lot of his books and summarized it and did the Demartini method on him and then had six chiropractors do the method simultaneously on B.J. I got to play the surrogate role and it was, it was amazing. I, I don't even know where and how I got the information, but I was just kind of uh, bringing out information to these guys in a dialogue when they were asking questions. And it was very, very cool. And um, if you've not seen such a thing, you, you kind of wonder where it all, where is that coming from? But I have a feeling that there's a, what uh, Vladimir Vernaski, the Soviet scientist who wrote the biosphere, described as the newest sphere, and Teller de Chardin, who talked about it in his Phenomenon of Man, called it the newest sphere. I have a feeling there really is a newest sphere, a domain, um, a transcendental domain, like a just like the internet cloud, we call it today, 
that has information that we don't see, but it's accessible through a computer, but we have to access it through a, an equilibrated mind, a state of grace. And if we're in a state of grace, we access it. You can't access it through emotion, but you can access it through a perfectly equilibrated mind. And that information is, uh, I, I think it's the immortal part of us, if you will. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining me.